So first of all, let's look at the different rates of effusion. Now remember that uranium-235 is the more valuable. That's the one that undergoes fission uh, in nuclear weapons and in nuclear power stations. Both of these isotopes that we're looking at come as uranium-4 oxide. That's the ore, spelled O-R-E. That's the natural rock that contains the uranium. So why not use effusion to separate out the oxides? Well, you can see that for every one meter the 238 uranium goes, the 235 goes one meter and six millimeters. So that's not a great difference there, is it? So effusion's gonna be quite tedious using the oxide. Well, what about using the metal itself? Well, it's exactly the same ratio. Once these are turned into a gas, their rate of effusion is very similar, so it's going to be hard to separate them. So what do they use? They actually use uranium hexafluoride. But paradoxically, that has an even worse differential between the rates of effusion. So why is this one used? Why not the oxide? Why not pure uranium? Well, for a start, uranium-4 oxide has a boiling point of 4,000 degrees C. And for effusion, you're going to have to turn something into a gas. It's ionically bonded. And metallic uranium, same problem. Very high boiling point. Now, not much machinery can stand up to 4,000 degrees C. It's incredibly corrosive at that temperature. So they use the lower boiling point, uranium hexafluoride. I imagine it's, well, it's got a lower boiling point than hand sanitizer. So if you were to rub it on your hands, it would just evaporate off really quickly. Feel kind of cold. No idea what it would do to you. So why does uranium hexafluoride have such a low boiling point? Well, I've put the electronegativities on each of the atoms in the molecule there. And you can see it's surrounded by like a negative layer of fluorine. Fluorine having the highest electronegativity. And all of the dipoles cancel out. So overall, the molecule is non-polar. So the intermolecular forces here are London dispersion forces, which are the weakest in IB chemistry. So it has a low boiling point. The discovery of fluorine and the use of fluorine is very dangerous. A lot of people died or were injured during its discovery. Some people were blinded and there were actually explosions as well. Some poor devils died in those. Many, many people were taken to the hospital. This guy's Henri Moissin. He got the Nobel Prize in 1906 not for the discovery of fluorine, but for isolating it and not dying or killing himself or his assistants. And if you look at his original photo, you can see on the left is air, in the middle is fluorine, and on the right is chlorine. It's tremendously dangerous stuff, which is another problem with making uranium hexafluoride. You need fluorine. So let's look at intermolecular forces. Ionic and metallic are the strongest. Now you could argue they weren't intermolecular forces, but the IB says it's okay. Hydrogen bonds are weaker, dipole, dipole weaker still. Dipole, induced dipole, even weaker. And in IB, the weakest are the London dispersion forces. So remember, you have to turn it into a gas to separate it via effusion. So uranium-4 oxide is ionic, uranium is metallic strongly held together, and uranium hexafluoride, that is held together by London dispersion forces. That is the intermolecular force, which is the weakest normally in IB. So why are we talking about this? Well, don't forget, you have to turn something into a gas in order to effuse it. And why do you want to effuse it? Because you want to separate out the isotope that you want. Why can't you use chemistry? Because isotopes have the same chemistry. You have to use physics. In this case, effusion. And I think it's interesting that Mendeleev was up for the Nobel Prize in 1906 for the periodic table, along with Moissin for his isolation of fluorine. But Arrhenius was on the Nobel Prize committee and he nixed Mendeleev's discovery. He said it was kind of old. People knew that anyway. 